Cool. Thanks everybody for coming. This is uh, component-based theming in the real world. Hopefully you're in the right place. If you're not, that's cool. I am uh, Brian Perry. I work for a company called uh, HS2 Solutions. Uh, we uh, are always looking for great people, people. so we got a booth uh, downstairs, come talk to us. Um, but I got a lot of uh, slides, so I'm gonna jump in and get moving. So I guess the first kind of question to ask here before we dive in, so this is about uh, component-based theming in Drupal and kind of some of the things that I've experienced uh, doing this on projects, uh, but, but how uh, familiar are people with the general concept of component-based theming? Just show of hands, who thinks they're comfortable slash familiar with it? Okay, uh, spattering of people. All right, so I did want to make sure to cover uh, some general background up front. This, this talk isn't uh, really an introduction to this topic, but I want to make sure we have uh, some sort of uh, base. Really what we're going to try to get to and focus on a little bit more are some of the uh, challenges I've seen in uh, trying to take this approach and uh, kind of what we might uh, be able to do to improve it. But at a high level, let's talk about what component-based theming is. So it's the concept of uh, building and creating modular reusable elements uh, in your theme that can be reused and also uh, used to kind of compose uh, bigger things, smaller pieces that you can use together in different contexts. The idea of building a design system and not a series of pages. There's a talk uh, yesterday, particularly on that topic. Um, but you know, it's the idea that uh, you know, if you get a Photoshop mock-up of a page, you're not implementing that page, you're breaking it down into its component parts, a page template, and uh, building the thing so that the next time you get a Photoshop mock-up of a page, uh, you can use, reuse those pieces, reuse those templates, rather than doing another beautiful snowflake of a page. Uh, and it's uh, popularized and often thought about with that, the atomic design uh, concept, uh, popularized by Brad Frost, um, but really any sort of way to think about um, breaking things down into smaller, uh, component parts uh, really works for the concept there. And then also you can use uh, with this process a living style guide or pattern library, which can be used as documentation for your project. Uh, also can be used as a great tool for rapid prototyping. Um, so things like uh, KSS and Pattern Lab and a whole host of, of other uh, tools that seem to pop up on a daily basis uh, can be used for that. But the, the general approach of uh, building using components doesn't necessarily depend on that. You can still structure things into smaller pieces that you can reuse. So uh, just quickly, uh, you know, why would one do this? So it definitely improves the way that you can reuse things. You can uh, build a, a component that you should be able to use throughout your site. Um, and, oh boy. Oh. I thought I'd beat this. Okay. Um, I'm sure that will never happen again. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, so you, it can give you reuse within a single project, uh, across projects, and uh, it's also possible to you know, create a component library that you could use even beyond Drupal. It uh, gives you nice, uh, well-isolated chunks of code. Uh, that you can reuse and also, uh, you know, kind of uh, isolate and understand, you know, what this component represents, uh, where the classes uh, for this component are coming from, things like that. It lets you potentially decouple front-end and back-end development so that it's possible to uh, build out components in your style guide before the functionality exists. Um, and then when the functionality is created, it can aim for the particular markup that's in your style guide, or there can be ways to integrate into the components and pass data into them. Um, it doesn't have to be a thing where uh, everything is made to look pretty at the very end of the process once everything's built. Um, and there are definitely some advantages, if, as we've touched on, in using uh, a living style guide as part of the process. It can really help with uh, coordination between uh, designers and developers. Um, it's a great way to you know, show what alternative takes on things would look like and do prototyping. Um, and even between developers and developers, it can be useful documentation. Um, and you know, talking about back-end developers uh, building something that can plug into an existing component or existing look and feel is 
pretty awesome. So that is the super high level overview, uh, a handful of other resources. Uh, these slides are listed on the talk page. Um, we'll talk about there's a little demo repository that linked there too. So uh, just a couple of links. I did a talk on a general style guide driven development last year at MidCamp. So there's a video and slides for that if you want to check that out. If you'd rather hear uh, people that aren't me talk about this topic. Uh, there was recently a really good uh, talk on Drupal 8 components-based theming, and another talk that I tend to go back to about just the general concept is uh, the style guide-driven development talk from DrupalCon LA a couple years ago. So all worth checking out. And there's also uh, quite a bit of resources on this topic and blog posts and video series and a lot of awesome stuff. So also, uh, another uh, piece of context, the real world. So the real world is where uh, on, uh, on projects I've been using this approach uh, to component-based theming in Drupal 8 and uh, you know, running into some challenges. It also, extremely superficially, is the MTV reality series where seven strangers are forced to live as roommates. And uh, it's really responsible for modern reality TV as we know it and uh, has just tons of episodes and spin-off series. It's really ridiculous considering when the, the show was created. So why MTV's the real world? Really for no reason aside from the fact that I can use these goofy cast photos in my presentation and my demo. Um, also because the 90s were an amazing time. <laughs> and uh, cast members could spin off into their own exercise shows called The Grind and have videos called Fitness with Flava, which I'd like to let everybody know is currently available as a VHS on Amazon. <laughs> and if somebody in this talk does not buy that and ship it somewhere, I'll be very disappointed. Uh, so uh, a few other things we'll look at. We're going to be looking at some pretty uh, simple examples to kind of demonstrate some of these concepts and some of the challenges. But uh, I did create a little uh, demo repository, which you can check out, play around with if you'd like. It also has a link to the slides. Um, so what it has is it has a uh, pattern lab implementation of uh, the, the uh, bourbon neat refills component. So uh, bourbon neat is a framework and they have a, a nice series of, of kind of plug and play components that you can grab. So it gave me something really nice that I could not only really think about how things look, but just think about how I could get this in my pattern library and then get Drupal to talk to it. And then also there's a little uh, Drupal site, which uh, so the, the pattern lab components are integrated into what I consider to be the world's number one Drupal-based real-world fan site. And if there's somebody who can disagree with that, let's talk. I'd love to know about that site. Okay, so uh, the kind of the beginning. So talking a little bit about the high-level concepts. Uh, something else to touch on is that um, although the concept of component-based theming and some of the things that we can do in Drupal 8 is a popular topic, and I hear about it a lot, and I hear a lot about you know, how themes can support it and things like that. Um, this concept is not new to Drupal by any means, um, so it's certainly possible to take this approach to theming before Drupal 8. Uh, in the past, it was probably a bit of a more Drupal-centric approach, so what are the things that Drupal, the tools that Drupal offers that can help us create things that are uh, you know, easily reusable and nice isolated chunks. Um, also in the past, for a handful of reasons, it, it's probably more likely that if you're using a, a style guide as part of this process, that some amount of your markup was being duplicated. You might define it in your style guide and then copy and paste it to use it in Drupal or, or vice versa. Um, but it wasn't necessarily all sharing the same source. So uh, a few things changed as they always do. So there's uh, Symphony and the Twig templating engine, which uh, obviously there's been a lot of talk about, I don't know, uh, at MidCamp and, and forever recently. Uh, there are tools like uh, KSS to uh, document your, your, your uh, code and generate a living style guide, or Pattern Lab, which is used to create a pattern library and is uh, kind of tied in with that atomic design concept. Then as we know, Drupal 8 uh, uses Twig as its uh, templating engine, and then uh, tools like Pattern Lab and KSS uh, started supporting Twig. So that certainly opened up some possibilities as far as how these systems can all talk to each other. So uh, at DrupalCon New Orleans last year, um, there was definitely a lot of uh, talk and movement on this topic about being able to have a single source of truth and have 
uh, your CMS and your uh, pattern library or style guide all using the exact same uh, markup and code. And there are a handful of approaches to that that, that kind of came out, some, some uh, talks, some starter kits, things like that, and it's continued from there. Um, but uh, so I've, I've been following along with that closely, using it on uh, recent projects, um, and I found that uh, the process that we'll look at definitely works, and uh, kind of what people have been doing here uh, definitely gets the job done, but I think it does present some new challenges um, and some potential pitfalls, and I don't feel like there's been enough discussion about, oh man, I just can't get anywhere near that. Um, there, I feel like there just hasn't been enough discussion about what those challenges are, so I want to spend some time on that. Just put, put some of the blue tape right here. So we're going to look at a uh, basic example of uh, how one might take this approach. Uh, this is season two, Los Angeles. The main thing I remember from season two is there was that guy with the cowboy hat who would always wear that cowboy hat, even like when he was in the pool in the hot tub, which is some really impressive dedication. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build a uh, card component uh, from the refills uh, patterns. And uh, for whatever reason, that seems to be the, the default example to demonstrate this concept. So the pieces of the puzzle that we're going to use for, at least initially for this uh, simple example, is uh, Drupal 8 and Twig. Um, and in this case, I'm going to use, uh, it, this could apply to the sub-theme of your choice. So uh, all the basics to be able to do this in any theme. There are definitely themes uh, you know, specifically aimed at doing this, uh, starter kits and things like that. But I think it is helpful to kind of know the nuts and bolts of, uh, of how this would all come together. And uh, you know, as I've alluded to, uh, using Pattern Lab here as a pattern library, it's the Drupal edition. And uh, in installing that, there's a handful of starter kits that you can pick from. I'm using the minimal starter kit. And then there's also one uh, supporting module, at least initially, that uh, some of this depends on. It's the component libraries module. And the thing that we're going to use from it is the ability to define a custom twig namespace. Uh, by default, uh, Drupal would only look in the templates directory for your templates, because it's called templates. Uh, so that allows you to, in your theme info file, to define different namespaces uh, so that you can provide different paths where Drupal can look for other templates. So if you have uh, a component library that lives elsewhere, you can point it there. So uh, we'll take a quick look at the structure of the theme here. Um, and how I approach this. So again, uh, we're using uh, Bourbon Neat. Uh, there's a Neato theme that has uh, all of the, the framework and libraries for that. So I created a custom sub-theme based on that called Neato Refills. And then uh, the Pattern Lab directory is where Pattern Lab was installed. Then the source directory is really where uh, most everything Lives. So anything that your pattern library and your theme are going to use is all going to be in source. And so all of those are obviously sharing the same stuff. And then templates is uh, Drupal's regular template structure where it looks for its templates. On the right, since it's where really the brains of all this is, is a deeper look at the source directory. The stuff with underscores are things that Pattern Lab uh, expects. There's the patterns directory, so that's where our components are, or patterns are going to live in this case. Um, pattern Lab by default uses uh, subdirectories related to the different levels of uh, the atomic design concept. You can name those things other things. You can name your patterns directory something else, but that's what we're using. Then the CSS directory, you know, all of the assets that you need for your theme and your components are here too. So the generated CSS is going to be in a CSS directory. We, if there's global JavaScript, it'll be in JavaScript. If you have uh, global uh, SAS that you need for your build, that lives there too. Okay. So uh, let's look at creating a really simple component, a card. So. Um, we're going to uh, create a subdirectory in the molecules uh, directory. So this really isn't the smallest piece. 
It's got a few different parts to it, so it feels about right to be at the level of a molecule, quote unquote. Um, we created a card directory, and the idea is that this card directory, everything that we need for this component, everything we need to render this component is gonna live there. So there is a SAS partial for it. There's a twig template. Uh, if there's JavaScript that this component and just this component uses, it could live there too. Other assets, you know, you might have like, uh, you know, SVGs or something that, that need to live in here. Also, you might have data for your pattern for your pattern library, so you can feed in example data into Pattern Lab in a JSON or a YAML file that can live here too. But you know, the idea is this director just has every little piece of the puzzle that you need to make this thing. So here's just a high-level look at what the markup for this card could look like. Um, you know, it's pulled out of the refills uh, examples. Um, and uh, it's using a BEM structure here for the, the markup and the classes. Um, so at the top level, there's a, the card class that wraps the whole thing. And then there's a, uh, the elements of the image, header, and copy. And you'll see that in some of those things, there are a few variables that we have, uh, like a few to render the image, there's the header, and the copy itself. And then there's the general structure of the SAS partial following a, a then structure. So we have the top level card, and then a double underscore, and the image header and copy, focus and hover states, all that stuff. Um, I do tend to follow the, this uh, BEM approach in uh, naming conventions on uh, you know things that I'm building myself and not ripping out of a, you know an example. Um, and also sometimes I tend to use a, a additional namespacing. Uh, along with like the atomic design concept. So something that's a molecule might be prefixed with like n dash and then the name of the class. Uh, but in general, following this approach or similar, uh, you know, uh, naming conventions really helps uh, give some structure to your components so you can understand what each piece relates to and the classes are specialized so it's a little bit less likely that there's going to be cascading and things running into each other. It's a nice isolated thing. So now we can build our component in Pattern Lab. Just a few things to touch on as far as the, the kind of brains and stitching together of what has to happen in Pattern Lab here. So um, we, again, we want to make sure that uh, Drupal and Pattern Lab are going to be using all the same stuff. So your, uh, any compiled CSS, um, Pattern Lab has in a meta folder a header twig file and a footer twig file. So in the header twig file, you're importing the CSS uh, that's being generated. And then if there's uh, JavaScript, uh, you can add that into the footer. Those would be libraries in Drupal. Um, and then you can use uh, pattern lab generate command to generate uh, the pattern library. So you can take a look and uh, experiment with things. Uh, also, you might have that hooked into uh, if you're using a task runner, you can have that hooked in with a gulp or grunt so that it's watching for changes in your components and then rebuilds Pattern Lab. Or you can have that hooked into a larger process where you know, can uh, update things in Drupal, clear caches, all that good stuff. But you know, you're probably going to eventually not want to have to run that generator in the first time. Uh, so we see the thing in Pattern Lab. It looks like a card. It looks like what we want. That's great. So now, how do we get that uh, over to Drupal? So there's definitely a handful of ways you can do that. Um, we're going to be, uh, you know, dealing with our super awesome real-world fan site here. So uh, there's going to be cast nodes, and we want to display them as a card. So again, there's a handful of ways you can go about this, but one that seems to make sense for displaying nodes in a particular format is creating a custom display mode. So I created a card display mode, and then we have the ability to have this uh, template suggestion node cast card.html.twig. So now we're gonna go through the process of trying to get Drupal to be aware of the component that we've defined and get the right data into it. Um, I find it helpful to actually take the middle ground step of literally just in that template, getting uh, Drupal to render the same component from Pattern Lab with all the same dummy data, and then doing the mapping from there. Um, maybe that step's not necessary for you, but I think it's pretty helpful. So 
here, all we're doing in that, that uh, node cast card template is referencing the component template from our component library. So we're gonna use twig's uh, include tag to do that. And then that at molecules there is the twig namespace that we've defined in our info file. So that just points to that molecules directory that we were looking at before. Path out to the twig template. And then we say with, and then there's just a list of the variables that are in the component template that we looked at. So there's the header, the stuff for the image, uh, and the copy. And here, we're just literally putting in the literal values of the things that we want to show up. So now we can see anytime we render a card, it has that card that looks like the card from our component library with this dummy data. Um, we're not going to go into uh, all the, uh, the other ways that you can include these templates, but I'll just uh, touch on them really quickly. There's also the uh, embed tag. So that lets you uh, pull in a component template where you may have defined uh, blocks in your Twig template. And that gives you the ability to override, um, I'm sorry, what I meant to say there was extends. There's extends and embeds. They both start with the possibly to keep them straight. Uh, so it extends, uh, there you might have blocks defined in your template. So when you extend that template, you have the opportunity to redefine those blocks in the template, and then um, uh, embed is kind of a, the combination of, of those two things, the, the best of include and extends, where you, uh, when you embed, all you can do is just embed that template and redefine the blocks. Uh, sorry, when you extend, all you can do is uh, redefine the blocks. Um, but the alternative is that you can redefine the blocks and use it as if you're including it. So you may have additional markup uh, above it, below it, wrapping it, et cetera. So uh, how do we actually get the Drupal data here? How do we get Julie from season one showing up in that card? Um, so uh, since we already have that thing stood up, all we're doing is in the render array, finding the appropriate variables uh, to pass in that data. So something like the header, it's pretty simple. It's just the label variable, which, uh, it, which wasn't called <coughs> label because it's actually the title. Um, for the body, it's just content.body. Uh, for something like the image itself, uh, you might have to dig uh, pretty deep to get at these things, at least using this approach. Um, so that, that certainly can be challenging. We'll talk about uh, how you might deal with that and why that's challenging. The other thing is that, um, you know, after having experience with doing this, uh, I don't know that necessarily getting the individual tiny pieces of the image is the right way to go. Although uh, that might not be the cleanest markup, it might potentially be a little bit different from what you do if you wrote that component yourself. Um, you're going to save yourself some pain if you, if you can take advantage of what Drupal would do to render the image and not fight against that. But uh, so you're going to have to do some debugging if you take that approach, at least initially when you figure out where all these things are. Um, so you can use Kit, uh, which is part of the develop module, um, which lets you print out these variables and, and kind of walk through the render array in this case. Um, you'll probably need to lower the, uh, the depth that Kit goes down into. Um, a, because it's unwieldy, and B, because you might uh, have the page hang or run into some memory issues. And then also, you're gonna, in general, in debugging this way, you're not gonna wanna just print out everything. You're eventually gonna have to target, uh, you're gonna wanna target specific pieces to find what you're looking for. Um, if you're really digging into this stuff, there's also the Twig Xdebug module, which lets you set a breakpoint. If you're familiar with using Xdebug for debugging, uh, you can uh, go through those variables in something like PHP Storm, uh, which potentially is going to be a, a little bit more efficient. So uh, that is the general concept of uh, being able to, to create a component outside of Drupal, map some Drupal data into it. Uh, you know, this whole idea of getting at the little bits and pieces to funnel it into the template uh, can be painful. So how can we make that uh, less painful? 
So uh, looking at mapping just the data that you need, there's definitely uh, some uh, modules that can help out here. Twig field value is one of them. So this lets you, it gives you a, a, a handful of twig filters, it lets you get partial uh, data from render arrays. So uh, some of them are self-explanatory, like field label, which is gonna give you the field label value. Field value gives you the render array without the field wrapper, so you can take out some of that wrapping markup. It's still the render array, uh, so not necessarily literally a value. Uh, there's field raw, which lets you get raw property values. Field target entity lets you get a reference entity object if you have an entity reference field, which can be useful. There's definitely some catches to this. Um, if you're using field raw or field target entity, uh, you can have, uh, there's some additional potential caching considerations and that you might be, for example, rendering things or using things from an entity that is not part of that node. Uh, so you might have to do some things to make sure that Drupal knows when the cache needs to be invalidated. There's a suggested workaround in the documentation for the tweak field value module. Uh, but the other thing, and I think this applies uh, to all the mapping examples that we looked at already, is that when you start stripping away uh, some of the things that Drupal depends on and getting down to just the, the exact values that you need to create your nice, simple, clean little component, it's really likely that you're gonna start taking away things that Drupal depends on. And you could be breaking things like Quick Edit or the Panels in Place Editor. Um, so that's definitely something to be careful of. So let's look at what this uh, simple card mapping would look like with Twig Field Value. It's definitely a little bit cleaner, uh, easier to potentially understand once you know what Twig Field Value does. So the image we can use uh, for the content field image, we can use field target entity to get at the field for the image path. Um, we can use field raw to get the alt value for the image. And then for content body and the label, we're just passing that through field value just to, to take the wrapping out of it. So this is something uh, a little bit more complicated, I guess. Uh, so let's say that we have a taxonomy on our cast member node and uh, we want to also display in the card some things related to that uh, taxonomy without render rendering the whole taxonomy term. Um, so we've got a season attached to a cast member now. So the first line here is that, uh, that potential workaround for um, using the uh, field target entity. Then uh, the next thing that we're doing here is we're just setting a variable that is the season entity using field target entity. And then once we do that, we can reference the fields and the things on the season. Uh, so we have season.name.value and then season field city dot value to get these two things. So uh, part of the reason of showing that example is also that um, when you start getting uh, comfortable with this approach, it can, you can get dangerous in that uh, you can get really carried away in what you're doing here. Um, the mapping could be complicated. Uh, you might be kind of walking the line as far as the sort of logic that's appropriate in a template like this. So definitely be careful. Uh, kind of a yardstick that I use is <laughs> if you're looking at a template and it's taking you a long time to, to you know, uh, get to something where you can understand what the markup's gonna be. Maybe you need to reevaluate what you're doing. Uh, I do think the line has moved a little bit as far as what's appropriate to do in a template um, versus things you should do in pre-processing. Um, but you definitely need to use your best judgment. If it's really something that's cosmetic or something that's simple, it might be appropriate to do in a template. If you're really kind of changing the underlying data, it's probably still something you should be doing in pre-processing. So then also, uh, we'll take a look at uh, the uh, more Drupal-centric alternative. There's a module uh, that's come around recently called the UI Patterns module, which is uh, a really exciting alternative here. And what it does is, it, at a high level, 
and lets Drupal get back in the, uh, the loop on this sort of data mapping for components. So the UI patterns module lets you define UI patterns. And then those UI patterns can be used with uh, component-friendly modules. And there are a handful of sub-modules that come with UI patterns. So let's use these patterns in things like views and field groups and anything that renders a layout. Then you can configure these mappings in the UI rather than doing it in the template, which is great. And then it also uh, creates a uh, pattern library page in Drupal as well. Uh, this is an example of what that might look like with a card. Um, so you know, it's not unlike uh, something like Pattern Lab or KSS, it's definitely not as, uh, as fully featured or maybe even necessarily intended to be. <clears throat> but you see your pattern, you see an example of the component here, and then you see all of the variables that that UI pattern uses. So let's take a look at how you would actually define one of these things. So if we wanted to make our card a UI pattern. So there's a, since it's Drupal 8, there's got to be a YAML file somewhere. So you can uh, create YAML files to define your pattern. So this one is card.ui underscore patterns.yaml. There's an ID for the pattern itself, which is the card. It uh, has a label and description. And then you're defining all of the fields. And uh, the, the IDs for the fields should be familiar because uh, those are the exact same names as the variables that are in your component template. So the data can just flow right through into your variable. So you have all the same stuff. Uh, the type right now is really just used for documentation. Um, that may change in the future. Uh, label that's going to show up in the UI. And then uh, if you're using the pattern library page, you can have a description and preview content. I believe those are both optional. And then, uh, so you, you can have one main UI patterns YAML file for your theme, but it, I think it does make sense to split them out into files for each of the components. Then this is going to give you, uh, by default, a template suggestion, uh, pattern card.html.twig. There's some other more specific suggestions there, too. Or um, you can also use this use value in the UI patterns YAML file to reference the template direct, du directly. So it's the same path. You can use your, uh, your uh, twig namespace here. Um, so this would allow you to just, in your YAML file, reference the component template, and you wouldn't need to use the twig template at all. There was a weird bug up until recently that made that process a little bit difficult to do with Pattern Lab, um, but it's been fixed. <laughs> But if you did want to use that template, uh, you could you know, obviously put markup in that template. But if you just wanted to use that template to explicitly reference your component, uh, potentially all you need to do is just have an include statement that just references the template. None of the mapping needs to go in there. So then, uh, once the UI pattern's been defined uh, and Drupal knows about it, um, you can select your pattern. So, this is still the, the card display mode for our cast member. Um, and we've enabled uh, display suite so we can get access to layouts. But also in that list, you'll see layouts. And then you'll also see a pattern section. And all of your UI patterns will be there. So we can pick uh, the card layout. And then there's also some additional settings that show up, which let you specify if you want to use default field templates for wrapping or just the content. Uh, in a future version, I believe that's going to be something that is uh, on a field-by-field -field basis, but right now it's for the entire pattern. And then when you do that, um, so this is the regular manage display page, you have each of your fields, and then there's a region column where you s just specify the variables in your pattern, which relate to the variables in your twig template, so you can just pass that data all the way through. And that is going to give you that card component yet again. So uh, let's look at some of the challenges with this process. I've definitely, you know, I think touched on them as we've gone along. But uh, I found that, you know, just understanding the process in general and how you can get uh, Drupal and your pattern library to share the same stuff 
and pass data into it, there's definitely uh, some time to understand how that all works. Uh, another common thing that I've run into is just in general when you're using something like Pattern Lab in this process, confusion around Pattern Lab versus Drupal. Like, what's a Pattern Lab thing? And what's a Drupal thing? Um, and it takes some time for people to understand that, that it, it, at least if you're taking this approach, it's not really like that. There's your source that both of these things can use. It's all the same markup and code. Um, you might go to Pattern Lab to look at uh, a certain rendering of one of these components or experiment with stuff, but it's all the same code. And then you know we looked at the mapping and everything. Uh, even with using something like UI patterns, there's potentially some overhead for getting the right data into these components. Um, but I do think that cost is kind of offset by how reusable this stuff is. Um, and I think you'd have to just take, there'd be other work to get uh, things styled the right way uh, using other approaches anyway. Uh, so you can uh, improve this process a little bit. Uh, documentation definitely helps. And the good thing is that documentation is kind of built into this approach in general, in that you have your pattern library that is documentation. You can see all these things and provide descriptions of, of everything. You see the variables and the markup. Um, defining just the process in general and your expectations for your team is important too. Um, I've also found that uh, trying to abstract these things for uh, reuse uh, really does help and pay off. And if it, when it's possible, try to think beyond just the current needs. So if you're doing a card for a real world cast member on your really important real world project, um, try to think, see if you can take a step back and think beyond just like, I want to show a cast member in this card. Is there any value in creating like a generic idea of a card that you know other things can go into? And is there anything that I need to do to abstract this a little bit more? It'll definitely help. I, I'm not implying that I've been on a project where all of a sudden everything was a card, uh, but that might be what I'm implying. Uh, and also, you can use, uh, you know, in a pinch you can still use the templates that Drupal's looking for. Um, so if something needs to land in there, that's fine. Maybe it's something that you refactor to be in your component library later. So uh, this is like thinking ahead a little bit, but um, I'm definitely really excited about the UI patterns module. And I think it can help with this process a little bit. Um, and how I think that might work is that uh, components might begin their life in Pattern Lab. So if you're building something that is gonna be related to functionality that doesn't exist yet, or uh, you know, a small piece that might be part of a larger component, um, or you know, Pattern Lab is still going to be really great for large-scale prototyping. How can I create this big template experiment with a bunch of different things in it that would take a lot of work and elbow grease to do uh, in Drupal? And then eventually, maybe something would graduate to being a, a UI pattern. So you know, now you've got quite a bit of documentation about it. It's in your Pattern Library. It's documented as a UI pattern. Um, and it should be a, a lot more predictable to plug into it in Drupal. Um, you should be able to map data into it and reuse it in a bunch of different ways. Um, and you know, there's less kind of understanding the data mapping in a Twig template. So I don't know. I think there's some promise with that approach. Um, I have a very limited amount of time, but uh, I don't know. A couple things that I can show. I do have a little demo-y sort of thing that I can show if people want to see uh, mainly just the UI pattern stuff, what that looks like in the UI. Uh, or if it would be people would be more interested in saving time kind of questions. I can do that. I don't know. Anybody have a personal opinion? Well, my computer thinks that it's <laughs> over. All right. I will. Uh, I'll just uh, keep through uh, going through here, as my slides say. So let's just take a quick look. Um, I don't know. I find it helpful to see some of this UI pattern stuff in the UI. Um, this will be a bit of an extreme example, but. So here in Pattern Lab, I just pulled out some components from uh, the refills here. And uh, I have a lot of different uh, text formats, but uh, there's the side image component. We got our card. Um, and then we also have a few different ways to render tabs here. A um, couple presentations of that. And then a Flexbox grid, and then also these bullet points. So. If we look here in 
our little demo sites. Uh, we have a view here that has um, the taxonomy terms for the seasons using that side image pattern. So in this case, it's a, a display mode um, for the side <laughs> image that's being used on this taxonomy term, plugging into that pattern. But if we drill in here, we see all of our wonderful season one cast members in a little flexbox grid. Um, and just to kind of understand uh, you know, some of the ways you can take advantage of these patterns. So this is a view. And here, we're showing a pattern rather than fields or uh, content. And then when you do that, and have specified some fields on the view, you can pick your pattern here. So we have a handful of different patterns. I pick Flexbox. And then when you do that, for each of the fields, you know, just like we saw in some of the screenshots, you can specify uh, exactly uh, what variable that data should just flow into. And then you see your cast member view. So now uh, we'll drill into Kevin here, which has some data. And I think this definitely uh, kind of falls as a, a bit of an extreme example. But uh, so we've got just some highlights here that are in a little tab view. And we have uh, the bio, the hero here. It's simple, but it is also a, a UI pattern. Same with uh, all these little expand and collapse sections on the, the right. But um, so let's say that this tab thing, there's really not a lot of information there. The tab seems like overkill. Um, that's based on a paragraph. So we have uh, here this like bullet point um, pattern. Maybe that might be a little bit of a better way to, to render something that's pretty simple like that. So we can actually, again, I don't know, this is a bit of an extreme example. You might actually just have different paragraphs to do this if you were doing this in reality. But um, we can actually just take the highlights and change the patterns for that. Because it is, at the end of the day here, just uh, a list. It's an unordered list that has certain classes. So the actual data that goes into and the general structure of it is, is the same. So uh, for our paragraph here, um, I have a wrapper around the paragraph. Uh, so right now, UI patterns doesn't really have a way to have patterns inside of patterns, so I had to fake it a little bit here. Uh, but it is something they're working on for a, an upcoming release. But uh, if I go into the display, I can just go ahead and change the pattern from my accordion tabs to my icon bullet points. Save my pattern here, um, just like it does with layouts. If you change, it's going to ask you where the, um, you know, what region in layouts terms uh, things should go into. So we just have uh, bullets. We're just passing all of the bullet points in. And if I just go to the highlight here, which is the other piece of this paragraph, go down, pick that I want it to be a bullet point item save things. In this case, it's so similar that the actual variables are the same, so I don't really have to change anything. Save that. And I should be able to look at Kevin here and see the bullet points. And, uh, and also, you know, I talked about doing some of the mappings in the twig templates. It's kind of easy to potentially strip away things and break things. Uh, this is a, a page manager page using panels. And I still have the ability with all my uh, UI patterns here to kind of move things in the panels in place editor. And everything still works nicely. Um, it's definitely a lot more mindful of um, you know, things like quick edit and panels IPE and stuff. Um, so uh, I don't know. That's kind of an extreme use case of how you might use those things to swap in the different patterns. But I feel like it's helpful to see that up on its feet. Uh, so. Last little piece, just briefly uh, talking about kind of where things are going. Um, there's a lot of continued efforts uh, on this whole component-based theming topic. Um, there's things going on in the components module. There's uh, been some work in, in the past on being able to have uh, inline templates to be able to do a lot more of that nesting kind of stuff. Um, 
A really common thing uh, that people are working on in various contexts is, is having the ability to uh, discover these components if they live somewhere else. There's definitely a lot going on with the UI patterns module. Um, they're working on being able to have like sub patterns, uh, uh, modules to do uh, discovery of components and things like Pattern Lab and other common style guides. Um, and it's all moving very fast. And then there's also definitely some stuff going on in core. I mean, in general, people are looking at ways to try to uh, improve this component-driven uh, theming process in Drupal in general. One thing that has been kicking around for a while that hasn't gotten through yet, I believe, is the ability to actually have uh, dependencies in your theme. You know, like I talked about a couple of modules that this theme depends on. Right now, there's really nothing I can do except say, oh, you got to install these modules. I trust that you'll do it. And if you don't, it's not going to work. Um, but there is a patch to have uh, dependencies in themes. Also, the layout plugin is uh, in core in uh, 8.3 as an experimental module. And I think uh, since some of these concepts depend on that, I think it's great that uh, layout is now going to be kind of a first class citizen there. One of the challenges is that I, I think a lot of the things that do use layouts are going to have to do some refactoring to use that. Um, yeah, I'll, certainly uh, a lot going on there, a lot of exciting things. And I, I don't know, uh, I'm really into this process, obviously. And I think that Drupal um, is really kind of in the forefront of being a, a really great environment to take this approach to theme. So it's super exciting. That's it. Uh, any questions? And time. Well, we can maybe go over just a little bit for questions, or we can just talk outside or something. But I'll tell you first. Yeah. I, too, have been on a project where many things are hard. And I was kind of curious if UI patterns has any sort of thing to expose choosing variations or fiddling with um, different configurations that expose your creating Yes, that, that question was about like uh, being able to have variations of uh, right, a pattern. Right, they could choose colors or, you know, this thing is on the left or the right, or I know there's some ways to do that. But. Yeah, so um, that's a tough one to answer quickly, uh, but I, I know that UI Patterns is working on the concept of variance, so they're experimenting with that. There's definitely things you can do in theming in general. Um, but also, when we started, when we looked initially at some of the things you can do in Twig templates and mapping and having like light logic in your Twig templates, you can certainly use those things together so that UI patterns handles the mapping, uh, but there might be some things in your Twig template that can handle those different variations. Maybe you have a field that defines some of those things. So that might be one way to do it, kind of using those two approaches together. Um, there are some other modules that, that also handle that sort of configuration. One that I saw yesterday in the um, design systems, not pages talk, was Stacks. Uh, I haven't used it, but it might be worth looking at. It looks like that is potentially a little bit geared towards more of that sort of configurable element. Cool. Is this approach something you're planning on using exclusively? Um, I mean, exclu um, exclusively is a, that's a, a, a big commitment, but I mean, Basically, <laughs> uh, I think it's I think it works really well and it's really efficient. Um, so yeah, it's definitely my default. So have you considered using uh, custom block types as a tool for uh, representing a component? Um, kind of. Uh, so I mean, if you're if you are going to take the approach of using panels uh, for your page layouts that's kind of what happens. Um, but as far as building custom blocks for each of the individual pieces, um, I mean, there have been some cases where that was the most efficient route, but it, I don't really see it as the default because there's so many other ways to do it. I don't know if there's something specific that's kind of driving well, that Well, I question. mean, I generally try to use as much of core as I possibly can, and it seems to, all these solutions are creeping up that you know really are pretty much the the exact same as doing that. And I think like because it's core sponsored, it's pretty well integrated with views, with layouts, with you know everything. So I mean I, I kind of have a hard time <laughs> getting away from that, especially when you can build your own structures, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one limitation I had was that I couldn't expose a twig template per block type. So I ended up writing a contrib module for that. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely not, uh, you can definitely create uh, additional template suggestions to do that. Yeah, pull up the next 
Okay, we're done. Uh, find me a talk more, talk online if you have questions. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>